Once again, let me add my welcome and happy Mother's Day to all of the moms, grandmothers, mothers-to-be, uh, and to all of you that are here. Um, this is a special time of worship, and as, as Kim said, we see, and God sees those of you for whom this is a difficult day as well. But we're going to come to God's Word. Before we do, I just want to say, I spent the last uh, 48 hours on a retreat with our, some of our staff and some of our executive council, our church board. Uh, play, praying, planning, and thinking about the future. And one of the things we do is celebrate all that God is doing and has done in our church. And so just want to say we're so grateful for all of you who are generous. One of the things we talked about is where we are, how we're doing financially, what the, the landscape is for the church and all of our campuses financially. And we just want to say thank you, you to, for your generosity and contribution to the work of God. If you're here as a guest or a visitor, we don't want you to feel pressure. This is not a pastoral ploy to get you to give money. Uh, we're just glad you're with us. But for those of you that call Chapel Street Church your home and your spiritual family, your generosity generosity honors God. It moves the mission of God forward in our community and around the world. Uh, and it's good for our soul because it reminds us that we're not dependent on the things of this world. All we have is a gift of God's grace. So thank you for that. Let's pray once more and ask God to speak through his word. Father God, thank you for being a generous God. All we have is a gift of your grace. The center of our faith is that you so love the world that you gave your only son. And we ask now that you would speak to us through your word, we pray it in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, the living word. Amen. I have a friend and mentor of mine. His name is Jerry. Uh, he preached here a few years ago. He's a remarkable guy. He's a huge influence in my life. He tells a story. He grew up in, in California, very poor, in a public high school, uh, but very fundamentally, uh, like a fundamental legalistic Christian home, all about rules. And uh, when he was a little kid, the movie, the Disney movie, The Shaggy Dog, came out. Some of you have no idea what that is because it's really old. <laughs> and he wanted to go see The Shaggy Dog. This is long before Netflix was even a thing or thought of or conceived of. You had to go to a theater, buy a ticket, wait in line and, and to see the movie, which I think is, this still happens today. Anyway, he wanted to see The Shaggy Dog so badly, but the pastor of his church said, if Jesus comes back and you are in a movie theater, he will not go in there to get you. He will leave you. So Jerry thought, well, I want to see the shaggy dog, but I don't want to lose my soul. He's like a 10-year-old kid, you know. And he said that his mother bought him a ticket and told him it was okay, which he thought, well, that's great. But then he also thought, does she not care about my eternity? Like, what's going on here? So that might seem ridiculous to us, that God wouldn't save you out of a movie theater if you're in there especially when you consider all the things that are just available with a click today that make the shaggy dog look very mild by comparison. But maybe you also grew up in a church or religious environment where it was all about the rules. Staying on God's good side by what you did, do, or did not do. I have another friend who was in a pastor's cohort with me. He tells the story. He grew up in a pastor's home. Uh, wonderful mom, wonderful dad, Christian influence from the time, he, as early as he could remember. And as he, when he was in his late teens, early 20s, uh, college and beyond, he, he just grew bored with it. He said, I grew, my Christian faith grew stale, and I began to be convinced by friends and by my own thinking that I, I was missing something. I needed something more. No, there, was not a, there was no life here. I needed more experience of God. And so he said, I went in search of all kinds of religious experiences, all kinds of places, not just Christian ones, prayer experiences. And he says, I went way off the reservation, his words, way, way off of what would be considered like normal Christian experience, looking for something. And he says, what all it did was I found it empty and brought me right back to the word of God and the little church I grew up in. And now I, I love it more than ever. And he's a pastor to this today. Maybe you have experienced that where you've thought, I need, I long for and need something more than what I currently have. And you're looking for it in some sort of experience. Now, there's nothing wrong at all with following the rules and there's nothing wrong with having experiences of God. Those are good things. But when they become the measure of our, uh, of our relationship with God, and, or the, and the measure by which we look at other people's relationship with God, that becomes a problem. And that's what's going on in the church in Colossae, which we've been studying the book of Colossians called the fullness of God. And what's happening in Colossae, it's a 10-year-old church, and they began with faithfulness to the gospel. And over this last 10 years, different ideas are creeping in, different rules they have to follow different experiences they need to ensure that they're okay and they, they're right with God. 
And Paul is writing to address that. Our, our memory verse is Colossians 1, 15 through 20. As a church family, I'm sure you've all got it down by now. We sang it in the opening song. Uh, so who would like to stand? I mean, I joke about it, but this, this week we're going to do it. <laughs> what do we need? I'll do it, right? If you know it, say it with me. It's not going to be on the screen this time. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. You can see I lost you there in the last few verses. <laughs> Keep working on it. It's worth memorizing. It's worth getting from your mind into your heart because that's who Jesus is. And Paul is centering his whole letter on who Jesus is. And now he's moving into like what's happening in the church that he needs to address. So we're gonna look at a couple of things here from Colossians chapter one, verses 23 and 28. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. Notice that phrase here, not shifting from the hope of the gospel. Not shifting from the hope of the gospel. That you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Verse 28, him we proclaim, that's Jesus, warning everyone and teaching. So Paul says, don't shift from this because I'm gonna keep telling you who he is and I'm gonna warn you about the errors of losing sight of him and teaching you about who Jesus is. If we move on to the next couple of verses in chapter two, verses four and verse eight, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible, that means fine sounding arguments. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Stuff that sounds good, but is not Christ. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So you can see a progression here. Don't shift from the gospel. I'm proclaiming him to you, and I'm warning you and teaching you. And I'm saying this so that you will not be deluded or taken captive or deceived. Stay focused on Jesus. Do you see a theme that Paul's saying? But we don't really know, up to this point, what is, this, what is the issue? What, is the, what are the errors? What is it they're, they're, they're reaching for other than Jesus? And in the passage we're gonna look at today, that becomes a little more clear. Paul lays it out for us. Our theme uh, is, is that the title, the fullness of God, we've been saying it this way. The fullness of God is in Christ, and we are filled up in him. Everything you need to live a full life, a good life, the best life, you have in Jesus. And to go looking somewhere else is to empty yourself of that fullness, which you already have. So why would you ever trade him for the emptiness of anything else? Now sometimes you read the New Testament letters and you find yourself wondering, well, what was it like? Do you ever wonder that? What was it really like in that church at that time? What were they dealing with? Paul gives us a couple of insights here. We don't always get all the details, but here he gives us some specifics about the challenges they're facing. And I would suggest, I think these challenges, this first century little church in Asia Minor was facing, are very relevant for us today. Let's read verses 16 through 23 of chapter two. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insulting on, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they're used. According to human precepts and teachings, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. There's a lot Paul's saying here. Let no one pass judgment on you. Let no one disqualify you. Why go back to the old way of life? 
But what's the what, judgment about what? Disqualify you about what? I'll put it this way. If the fullness of God is in Christ, do not be led astray into dead religion and false spirituality. If the fullness of God is in Christ, do not be led astray to dead religion and false spirituality. If the fullness of God is in Christ, <laughs> hey, how about that? That's good. Do not be led astray into dead religion or false spirituality. So clearly someone is uh, stirring up dissent. My good mate, John Dixon, uh, calls this person in his commentary and sermons on Colossians, he said, this is the influencer. We don't know for sure if it's one or m- many people. There's someone or some ones in the church influencing them away from Christ into dead religion and false spirituality. The underlying accusation here is that what you have in Jesus is not enough. And I would suggest, I think we hear that all the time in our culture, don't we? It's good, good that you go to church and you have a religious faith. But you probably could use what? Something more. You need something more. You lack something. The entire, we're bombarded with this. There's whole industries, billion dollar industries designed to convince you that you're in need. And they've got what you need. Let's talk about these things, dead religion and false spirituality. First, dead religion. I'll define it this way. Dead religion is following rules and performing rituals in order to impress God. The the underlying assumption here is that God needs you to impress him. He's waiting for you to please him and impress him with your obedience and your rule following and your ritual tradition keeping. This, uh, maybe another term for this sometimes is, is the word legalism. According to the law. That if we, if we follow the rules, keep the traditions, God is more pleased with us. Or at least he's not too mad at us. Some grow up, and I've talked to people like this, maybe it's you. The God's the angry stepfather in the sky. Or a grumpy grandpa. You, don't know, he, you just never know, he might snap. So walk the st- straight and narrow. One guy said to me, like, you know, I, I would come to your church, but I'm afraid if I walked in, the whole building would collapse on me. I'm like, you're not, first of all, you're not that important. Second of all, you don't really know God. That's not how he operates. Let's look at verses 16 and 17 of the text here. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Now, these are references to Jewish laws. Jewish food laws, dietary laws, Jewish clean laws, Jewish festivals, new moon and Sabbath, and so on. No one pass judgment on you because you're not keeping the rules, in other words the Jewish rules, and then he says this fascinating thing. He says, these are just a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Shadows and substance. uh, This is a fascinating thing that Paul is telling us here. Paul knew a thing or two about law keeping. You read Romans chapter 14, and he tells us that God's, the goal in keeping the law is not to please God, It's to walk in the way that he's, I mean, it's not so that we earn his favor. God is pleased with obedience, but you already have his love and favor in Christ. And therefore, we want to, out of love, live the way that he's laid out for us, not in order to earn it. That's law keeping. That's living under the law. Legalism is measuring your own or someone else's spirituality by your ability to keep the man-made rules. When I went to Wheaton College as a freshman, I went to a public high school. I came to genuine faith in, in Jesus late in my adolescent years in high school. I was uh, not the refined individual you see before you today. I was rather rough around the edges in, in all ways, specifically spiritually, and immature, very immature. And I was really, I didn't say this, though, I was really intimidated there. I thought everybody was like a spiritual valedictorian. They all knew the Bible better than me. They all knew, they just were better Christians than I was, and I felt really less than. And it took a while for me to recognize that that's not how God sees this. We're all his children, saved by his grace, brought into his family. And he invites us then into a life of obedience, which he empowers us to live. I've said this many times before, like wait, saying, well, I'll come to church once I get my act together spiritually. It's like saying, I'll go to the gym once I get in shape. It doesn't work. I've tried that. <laughs> Notice what he says in verse 17. These are the shadow, but the substance belongs to Christ. The Jewish law was a shadow. The Jewish law was meant to point. 
It's, it's a symbol pointing to the substance. That there, for there to be a shadow, there has to be something that casts the shadow, right? There has to be something from which the shadow is cast. What, the, what Paul is saying is Christ was always that substance, that thing which the law and the sacrificial system were only a shadow of pointing to. To make you see the sub, Jesus himself says this in Matthew chapter five, when he comes on the scene, he says, I have not come to abolish the law. Meaning Jesus doesn't come on the scene and say, that whole Old Testament thing was a huge mistake. We're starting over. That's not what he says. He says, I have not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. Right? The smallest letter, the least stroke of a pen will not disappear until everything has been accomplished. And it has been accomplished at the cross. Fulfilled. So the law is meant to point us to Jesus. And Paul's saying to these Colossians, you already have him. He's fulfilled it and done it and completed it. So walk in him, not legalism. Let no one judge you. Martin Luther famously put it this way. By the way, if you didn't know Luther before, he was the Reformation father. He was an Augustinian monk. And uh, here's what he writes about his monkery. <laughs> Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. Oh, wait, that's not right. We had a, a huge typo in the slide. I'll read it for you because I have it in my notes. Uh, we, we, somebody just copied and pasted the scripture there. But what it's supposed to say is this. I kept the rules of my order so strictly that I can say, if ever a monk went to heaven on account of his monkery, I should certainly be there. He said, I tried this way, this legalistic way of living. I tried to measure up by keeping the law, and it didn't work. And he came to know the righteousness of God by faith. He talks about in Romans chapter 3. Now again, nothing wrong with keeping the rules, but they're not the measure of your standing with God. Christ is. You might be thinking, well, this is fine, but I am not in danger of becoming a Jewish legalist, and I am not into monkishness either. Yeah, but I think legalism is alive and well. There's a legalist in every one of our hearts. Because it's, it's a way we want to measure to know we're okay. And Paul's saying, Christ is the way you know you're okay. He is how you know. The, the, back to that shadows and symbols idea. When I would go on uh, retreats with, uh, when I was a high school pastor many years ago, my wife and had, our three kids were little and at home. And this is before you could rec- uh, take lots of pictures. I had just the, the flip phone, you know. If you don't know, you can look it up. Uh, <laughs> But uh, my wife had this little alarm clock, which had a picture, a digital picture of our kids, my, and it had their voices as the wake-up call. Uh, it was, it was all, I wish I lost it. I wish I still had it. And I would, you know, look at that, those pictures and listen to their voices every day. It was great. It was a shadow, in a, in a sense. It was a wonderful, beautiful, deeply touching reminder of the substance, because I was away from them. But it would be a terrible thing for me to go, well, I've got this. I don't need them. I've got their voices. I've got their pictures. Be a horrible replacement for a real family. It's kind of what Paul's saying here. Why would you ever trade what you have, the real thing, the whole point, for the shadows that are meant to point to him? Whatever those rules may be. So, so let's stop living in the shadows and walk in the light of Christ. The second error creeping into the Colossian church was a kind of false spirituality. False spirituality will define it this way. Seeking a kind of mystical experience in order to encounter God. Feeling like I need some, like uh, my, my religion needs some, I need some uh, jolt, some experience. And maybe you've felt some staleness in your faith at times. Maybe you felt like, you felt a little dead or you felt like a little, like, I just, I'm not, I need something. That's not, I've, I've felt that way. And it's not wrong to desire a deeper experience of God's love and mercy and grace and power and truth. That's a good thing. But when that becomes the measure Like, I'm only close to God, I'm only okay with God if I have the experience. That's a problem. Look at verses 18 and 19, again, of the text. Let no one disqualify you. Uh, That means to cast dispersions on or set you aside. Insisting on asceticism. Asceticism is like, if legalism is following the rules, asceticism is like, it's the negative side of that. It's uh, all the things you're not supposed to do. Paul gets to that later at the end of the passage. And worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Let no one disqualify you with all these visions and uh, talk about angels and need for experience. 
This is what Paul is saying. A, pa- a pastor and former professor of mine would often talk about his experiences of prayer. And I was in a, a class of his on, on spiritual formation. And he talked about his prayer experiences. And I remember I was a young, I was in youth ministry. I was taking these classes, working on my master's. And I remember thinking, the way he describes his prayer life, mine is nothing like that. And I felt in, inadequate. I felt like, wow, and I longed for an experience of what he described. Closeness to God, intimacy with Christ. I didn't, I, I didn't have what he described, I didn't feel. And there was, that's a good thing, to long for more of Jesus. But what happened to me slowly over time was this, and maybe you can relate to this. I began to think that because I didn't have his experiences, my own experience of God was somehow invalid. Because I didn't have what I, I perceived him to have. That somehow my prayer life was invalid. I think Paul is saying here to the Colossians, you do not measure your spirituality based on someone else's description of their experience. You have Christ, who is the fullness of God. And you cannot base your experiences come and go. In the words of the immortal theologians, Boston, it is more than a feeling. (laughs) That's what Paul is saying, I think, to us as well. Notice what he says here about it. Not holding, he says, these are puffed up without reason. This is interesting, without reason. Not holding fast to the head from which the whole body is nourished and grows. It's a, it's a kind of headless spirituality. All, all feeling. No substance, no content. All experience. You, if you base your spiritual life, your Christian life, on anything other than Jesus, you're, you're decapitating your, your faith. There's no, there's no growth that is from God. There's no real growth there, no real life there, despite how it may feel in a given moment. And I've, I've been around enough to know this happens in youth ministry and even here, like people base their, their Christian life on how they're feeling. I feel close to him. Things are great. The worship was amazing. I felt something. I, we should feel things, but that might just be emotion. I don't know about you, but I could eat some bad tacos and get emotional. Like it's like, you can't base it on that. Don't cut yourself off from the head. Who is the fullness? Um, in, on February 8th of this year, in, uh, in, a, in a regular chapel service on a Wednesday, in Hughes Auditorium on the campus of Asbury University. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. You see an image here on the screen. Something happened after that chapel service. A handful, a couple dozen students at Asbury University stuck around to keep worshiping and praying together. Small group. They stayed for a couple of hours, and other students joined them. Soon there were about 100 or more. The university professor sent out an email to the campus community, very simple email, that worship after chapel has continued. All are welcome to join. Before the end of the, that, before that evening, there were several hundred. The place was almost full. And over the next three weeks, this grew into what some called revival. Clearly was a movement of God. There, by its, by, at its height, there were 10,000 people a day. They couldn't fit them all. Waiting, camping out on the lawn, waiting to get in to be part of it, to worship God. Worship services breaking out on the lawn around and then spilling over into uh, community buildings as well. Estimates of over 100,000 people over those three and a half weeks made their way to Asbury University in Kentucky to experience this. Now, I, I think it's a wonderful thing that m- many of the younger generation were crying out to God, praising God, seeking God, falling on their faces before God. I have friends who went to see it and witnessed it. That's a beautiful thing, and I long for more of that in in our communities. But here's something else I noticed. Pastor friends and uh, mine and and others were, and and people online that I knew but didn't know personally began to critique it. And some began to go and say, uh, so it's either side, either we're we're critical of it, though we haven't experienced it, or why isn't this happening in your church? or in your school, or in your community. See, this is real spirituality, and you have to have it the same way there. And there were all these attempts to reproduce it, to transplant it, and it over time fizzled. I really do believe that what began there was a move of the Spirit of God in the hearts of young people, and that's a beautiful and good thing. But we, we, we have a tendency to mess up movements of God, to gunk it up with our desires. And I would just... I think what I experienced and saw there was it became a litmus test. Ah, this is what it's like. We have to have it here. I think what Paul is saying 
to the Colossians and to us, you have the fullness of God in Christ. You have what you seek in him. Don't go looking in rules or experiences for what God has already given you in the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I wanna be clear. Obedience to Jesus, experience of his love, great things. But when those become the measurement by which we know we're okay or judge someone else, that's a problem. That will lead us astray. Now, when Paul warns about the worship of angels and visions, he's saying, when you center your spiritual life on anything other than Jesus, you're, it's inevitable that you're gonna be led astray. There's no life there. You're cutting yourself off from the head. Look at verses 20 through 23. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, that phrase, elemental spirits, just means the basic principles on which the world apart from Jesus operates. Why, as if you were still alive in the world, because you're not, you're alive to Christ. Do you submit to regulations? Notice what he says here, the do nots. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Maybe you grew up in a church that was all about the do nots. Don't do these things. Avoid these things. Refer to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they really can't change you. They're of no value where it counts. They can't change your heart or change your life. You wanna, and I think, I think sometimes Christians are um, rightly criticized for being known in the world by what they're against. And there are, there are certainly things that we're supposed to avoid, things that are out of bounds for a Christian, a Christ follower. But at the heart of our faith, it's not a negative life, it's positive. Go read the end of Romans chapter 12, verses nine through 21. It's really about the, what, what is the mark of a genuine Christian and see how many negative comments there are. There are none. It's you should be known for your praying, your rejoicing, your serving, your giving, your loving, your forgiving, your witnessing. This is what we're to be known for in the world. So you died with Christ and he's got great plans for you. Don't fall back again into rules and regulations. I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw something here for you if you can go to the blank screen here that um, I've used this before, but I think it's really helpful. It's helped me in my own spiritual journey. And the idea comes from a missiologist and anthropologist named Paul Hebert. He, he was struggling to figure out, well, how do we know who a true Christian is in the context where they don't grow up in a Christian environment? How do you, how, they don't, they don't, maybe they're illiterate in some part of the world. They don't have the Bible. How do you know what a true Christian is? He says what he noticed is very often in, in these kind of communities and in ours, Christianity gets defined by the rules. He called this a bounded set from mathematics. In a bounded set, the, the, your, the integers, the numbers, the values are defined by being inside or outside of a particular boundary. So a bounded set li literally looks like this. And the, the, the focus is here on the boundary. And there are all kinds of boundaries in the Christian life. And people are either inside the boundaries, they're in, or they're out. The boundaries are all kinds of things. Doctrinal, right belief, moral, behavioral, political, voting the right way, believing the right way, doing the right things, not doing the wrong things. We make all kinds of boundaries. And in the church, historically, we layer one boundary on top of another. And this is how we know who's in. And it doesn't really matter where, as long as you're just inside the line. You're one of us. You belong. And maybe you grew up thinking, well, I, I've always felt on the outside to God because I grew up in a church like this. It, because it's all about the boundaries. Notice what's, we're talking about Christianity. What's missing from this drawing? It's, it's not a trick question. Where's Jesus in here? He, and he contrasts this with what he calls a center set. I'm gonna, I've never used this. Oh, yes, it worked. Good. He called this a centered set. In a centered set in mathematics, the center is what matters, not the boundary. 
And a value is, de is determined based on its proximity to and movement toward the center. So you could put the values all over the place. In this case, the individuals, people. So, in this, in this idea, who's the Christian? This person maybe grows up in a Christian home, taught all the right things, but in their heart, they are headed away from Jesus. They are not surrendered to him. They're living their own way, and they're moving away. This person grew up without any knowledge of God at all, but they're have come to know God's love through Christ and they're moving toward him. At a given moment, it might look like this person, right? It doesn't mean there aren't boundaries. He says there are boundaries. There are things that are in bounds and out of bounds for Christians. And, but the point is Jesus. And the closer we get to him, inevitably we will come inside a way of life. This is, what, this is essentially what Paul's saying. You have the fullness of God in Christ. Stay laser focused on him and he will bring you into himself. And that will inevitably mean there are some things you're gonna, that you used to think were okay and you're gonna go, ah, oh, that's not okay for me because I'm following Jesus. But the focus is not on the boundary. The focus is not on the legalistic rules or the spiritual experiences you have to have or the things you're not supposed to do. The focus is on Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith, the image of the invisible God. He's holding us together and drawing us closer to him. If I have one heart for Chapel Street Church and I talk to our campus pastors, it's this, that we would be a centered set, right? Focused on Christ, moving ever closer to him. Maybe you can identify yourself. Some of you might feel like, hey, I'm way out here. But the point is, where are you headed? Some of you grew up in the church, you're like right here, but you feel like you're drifting, moving closer and closer to Jesus to the point where you recognize that he is who he said he was. We go back to this last verse. I'll, I'll close with this. This is from chapter one, our, our second sermon of the series. Paul, sort of a benediction of his first part of his letter, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. These are all past tense things that God has done for you if you're in Christ. You are not qualified apart from him. He qualifies you in himself. He has delivered you out of the domain of darkness and he's transferred you. I love that word, transferred. My wife said for Mother's Day what she wants is just to plant flowers. So we're gonna transfer some flowers from these pots into the soil in which they'll grow, right? They're gonna die if we don't do it eventually. And the way that's what Jesus has done for us. I'm plucking you out of this soil because you're dying and I'm planting you, transferring you into my kingdom, the richness of my love and mercy and grace. And here you'll grow and here you'll flourish and here you'll bear fruit. You have it in him. Let's pray together as we close. Father in heaven, we pause once again and acknowledge that we get these things wrong. We seek experiences. We feel as if we can uh, prove ourselves by following the rules. We try to measure ourselves or judge others, all the things that we are avoiding. And all this is dead religion and false. We thank you that the truth always resides in you, Jesus. Help us to move closer to you, to walk faithfully with you, humbly before you, and yes, we, we trust that you will give us the experiences we need and you will reveal to us your will for our lives. And that will mean that there'll be rules we must follow and things we must sacrifice and give up. But not to earn your favor, you've done that, you've given that to us because you've qualified us, you've delivered us and you've transferred us. And so we give you all the praise and glory and thanks in Jesus' name, amen. That you are so faithful and so good. And we do thank you for the gift of mothers. But we acknowledge that the remarkable love that a mother has for a child gives us just a glimpse of the love that you have for us. Lord, what an amazing thing that we can live in the assurance of your redemption and forgiveness of sin through the blood of the cross. 
Let us live as a people that have been delivered. Let the truth of that sink into our souls, Lord. May we be a body that is living boldly for the gospel. In your precious name of Jesus, amen. Would you remain standing for the benediction? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs>